I've never had the honor and pleasure of introducing a Nobel Prize laureate. And that changes now when I present to you Dr. David Baltimore. Thank you. you know, I don't know what it is you all would like to know, but I've seen a lot of questions, impressive questions. And it means that you've been reading about me. So you, you know a lot more about me than I know about you. And I hope I find out a little bit. How long do we have here? At least until 1230. At least until 1230, okay. At which point everybody gets hungry. Well, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I haven't brought your questions with me because they cover an enormous range of things. And I'd rather get the questions directly from you. So I will ask that you ask me what it is you're concerned about. And it doesn't have, to, most of the questions that I saw come from having seen my biography and actually apparently some of the papers that, that we've written. Um, and that's fine, and we can talk about science. We can talk about the headline science that you've all seen in recent times. That's Ebola virus. Because I, I'm a virologist. I know about viruses. Um, or we could talk about more general questions of careers and opportunities and interest in understanding life and its processes. Um, but before I do that, let me just give you a little outline of my life. So I'm actually born and brought up around New York City. I went to public schools, just as you are. Um, and then I went to Swarthmore College, a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. And I'm a great fan of liberal arts colleges. Do you have a question? Oh, you're just showing your, your machine. Um, and then to MIT for a short while, and then to the Rockefeller University, which you've probably never heard of, uh, which is in New York City, and is actually one of the great venues for discovery in, in biology and bi in medical science in the world. Uh, and then I spent much of my career at MIT, a short while in San Diego, which was my introduction to California. California to me in 1965, which is when I came here, uh, was opaque. I, I had no idea what it was. I, I knew it was west of where I had spent my life. Uh, and it was a revelation. And I, we, my wife and I always said that we might want to come back here and did come back here from MIT in 1997. And I came here because I was asked to be president of Caltech. And that was an enormous honor and an enormous responsibility and a very exciting time. Um, and I stepped down after nine years as president. At roughly 10 years is the longest time you should spend running anything. Um, because by that time, if you haven't done it, it's too late. Um, and I've stayed on in Pasadena living in Pasadena and uh, working at Caltech since 2006, uh, doing research on things that have always interested me. So what interests me? 
in about 1960, when I went to graduate school, I became interested in viruses. Viruses are the smallest living object. In fact, you can argue they're not living. But when they get going, they certainly can be devastating. So I think they're entitled to be considered living. But they're very tiny. So tiny that basically they are molecules. Um, and we treat them in that way. But they're fascinating. There are, there are many, many viruses on Earth. Every organism probably has its viruses. So bacteria have viruses that grow in them. And people have viruses that grow in them. And monkeys do. And armadillos do. And I can just keep going. There's even a virus that is the host for another virus. So even viruses have viruses. It's a very big virus found in the ocean. There are viruses in the ocean. There are viruses all over. And in fact, we, we harbor in our guts and on our skin and actually all around our bodies very large numbers of bacteria. Uh, there's more massive bacteria. There's more massive bacterial DNA, actually, than, than human DNA in a person. And each of those bacteria has viruses. So we're actually full of viruses that don't bother us. Don't, don't, they grow only in bacteria. And we hardly knew they existed until very recently. The ocean has so much virus in it that it actually is a significant fraction of the mass of the ocean. And most of those viruses grow in, in bacteria that, in turn, grow in the ocean. So viruses are a huge part of our world. But to all intents and purposes, we only care about viruses when they make us sick. And we get the common cold. And we get a lot of things that are worse than that, the worst one being Ebola at the moment. But that's not why I studied viruses when I started out in science. I studied viruses because they were the essence of life. They were self-duplicating organisms that consisted only of genes and protein coats, and some lipid coats. And so if you studied viruses, you were really studying the most fundamental processes that living systems can have, because viruses have shed everything else and only have genes that enable them to grow and to, be, to make the next generation of viruses. In fact, if you really ask what is the importance of life, on the planet. The importance of life is that it generates more life. Viruses generate viruses, people generate people, etc. And that's the, if you excuse my uh, solving one of the great philosophical problems of the world, that is the meaning of life. Uh, that's why we're here. And that's why viruses are here. And we have opposite interests from viruses often. They want to grow in us, and we don't want them to, because we don't want to be sick. And so we fight them off. But how they do that was totally obscure in 1960, when I started as a graduate student. It was obscure because we hardly knew what genes were. We hardly knew how living things were organized. And viruses taught us that. Because viruses have only a code of life. 
written in DNA or RNA, and some protection against the environment. And so they must show us just how living things work. And they have. And I've been uh, honored enough to be able to work on viruses for now what, 55 years. Um, but that wasn't enough for me because they are so small. And fundamentally, I'd gotten into biology because I was interested in people and how we live. And viruses are uh, only a little piece of that life. But the problem was that in 1960, you couldn't investigate how complex organisms work. We just didn't have the tools to do that. We didn't have the concepts. In 1953, Watson and Crick found the structure of DNA. I'm going to assume you've heard about that, right? Right. So I had Jim Watson actually on the stage at Caltech one day. And I was sort of interviewing him on the stage. And I asked him, well, in 1953, when you discovered the structure of DNA, what was the response in the scientific community? Did everybody invite you to come visit and give seminars and explain to them what you'd done? And, and were people aware that they, this was a, a revolution, and it was a revolution? He said, no. Very few people understood how important it was. Very few people singled him out and asked him to come visit. In fact, Caltech was one of the very few places where we really understood what was going on. And Jim Watson came to Caltech, actually, as an assistant professor, um, because other places weren't that interested in him. That was 1953. Four. But by 1960, when I was going to graduate school, it had begun to dawn on people that there was a revolution in progress. And that what we now call molecular biology, that is the understanding of biology through the understanding of molecules, was a reality. And the first molecule was DNA molecule of most importance. And so I've lived through the whole revolution in molecular biology. And I know all the people involved, and there many of them are my friends. Uh, but it wasn't until 1975 that you could begin to investigate how complex organisms live. Basically, what we learned to do in 1975 was treat them like viruses or bacteria. Um, very simple. We, we, we were able to simplify the problem. Simplification is one of the most important concepts in science. Because if you can simplify something, you can work on it. If it's embedded in a complex system, it's very hard to work on. Although we're beginning now by bringing mathematicians and engineers into biology uh, to learn how to deal with complex systems. So when I talk to some of my friends at Caltech who work, who are engineers, who work in a part of Caltech that is interested in dynamical systems, they tell me how they work on airplanes. And airplanes are one of the most complex engineering feats that, was ever, that were ever accomplished. They have to fly. They have to take people. They have to maintain pressure. Um, and they have to do all of this in an integrated fashion. They have to be able to go at very high speeds. They have to be able to go at very slow speeds. Um, 
And so they have enormously complex systems inside them. Um, and when you talk to a, an engineer who's dealt with those kinds of systems, they say, biology is just another example of a complex system. And if you can take it apart and understand the pieces, we can understand how the pieces work together. So we're beginning to get to the point now of being able to integrate all of our knowledge of the simple things. But I'm a simple guy, and I'm still interested in what's simple. And what was simple, what was the system that I wanted to understand in the body was the immune system. And I wanted to understand it because the immune system is the system that fights off viruses, that fights off bacteria, that fights off anything that's going to make us sick. Uh, and so there's a constant battle between the immune system and pathogens and organisms that are trying to make us sick. And that battle is interesting. And that battle involves evolution. But evolution in a different way than you've probably heard about it. So we know evolution on a large scale on the Earth. Evolution is the process by which organisms adapt to specific niches in the, in the environment. And they do that by changing their nature in small increments. Um, as they move into a different world, then they have to adjust to that world. And that makes for an enormous variety of things on Earth. But the immune system can't wait that long, because if there's a new virus in our surrounding, then we have to be able to understand that virus, we as organisms, immediately. And we have to be able to respond to that organism to that challenge immediately. Otherwise, the virus is going to overwhelm us and we'll be gone. And we can do that. And so, in fact, we don't bother to try to know all of the pathogens that might infect us. We have a system that evolves. The immune system is a system that evolves. It changes its nature as a function of the challenges that come to the body. And so this was evolution writ small, but fast. And that problem interested me. And I started working on it in 1975, 76. And so since then, I've been working on both sides of the street, I'm worried about the virus, the same time as we're worried about the defense against viruses. And that's made for a very rich scientific life, because I've worked both at the molecular level, at the most tiniest level, and at the largest level, the process of evolution. And that's gotten us involved in disease, um, and in how the immune system adapts to disease, but it's particularly gotten us involved in using viruses as tools to fight disease. Because since we know so much about viruses, and we do after years of study, we can make viruses work for us instead of against us. And it's a process which many people know as gene therapy, in which we capture genes and put them in viruses. And the viruses then bring them into cells, into the body. And if we put the right gene in there, and that gene has therapeutic value, we can use the viruses to help fight off disease. And that's very satisfying and very exciting. It's a part of medicine which is not yet um, commonly available. Uh, it's pretty uh, experimental. But I am confident it will become a common part of medicine.
So that's what I'm doing now, is trying to meld our understanding of viruses with the fight against disease. And of course, diseases are not all caused by, by viruses or by bacteria. Right? Lots, of, lots of diseases are caused by um, gene modifications. And we have to fight against our own genes. Cancer, in particular, is caused by changes in, in the genes that ordinarily make us what we are, but can go awry and, and uh, cause terrible disease. So we have to fight that. And the immune system is actually a very good way to fight cancer. But it's been only in the last few years that we figured out how to marshal the immune system to fight cancer. Anyway, those are the kinds of things I think about. Those that, that's a little outline of where I've been scientifically and even physically. Um, and I've never been to P Pasadena High School before, except to go to the farmer's market on Saturday morning, which is out in the parking lot. And I'll be there tomorrow, uh, partly because there's a fish lady there. there. She brings a truck full of fish up from the mark from San Pablo. And it's the freshest fish I know. So I come here buy fish and vegetables and other things. Um, any of you go to the farmer's market? Yeah? Good, good, good. Um, it's a good place to get fresh stuff instead of all the packaged stuff that we're told on television is what we should eat. So what, what held us up in applying the notions of molecular biology? Was it conceptual or was it um, experimental? And the answer is both. We didn't have the experimental means to understand how molecules functioned, and we didn't have the concepts to understand how they related to each other. And in, for instance, structure of DNA was elaborated in, in 1953, and we knew also from experiments a little earlier than that the DNA was the hereditary material. It was, um, and that was done by showing that you could transfer a biological trait from one bacteria to another with a piece of DNA. So DNA clearly was what directed this particular trait and by extension all other traits. Um, and another experiment which showed that you didn't need a virus to infect a cell. You could just infect with DNA. In fact, that's how viruses work. So viruses had the code for DNA, or virus had the ability to make a, a, a vi sorry. DNA had the ability to make a virus. DNA had the ability to change the nature of cells. So DNA was the hereditary material. But how did it do that? DNA is a very boring molecule. I mean, it's a double helix that has four constituents in it. And those four constituents just appear in a sequence that goes on endlessly, three billion times. And it's the sequence that matters. But we didn't know that at first. So the first thing that had to be understood, the first conceptual problem, was how did DNA work? And there were only four constituents. So you could figure out from the number four what the, whether it might be a coding problem. And that was everybody's first guess and the right guess, that it was a coding issue. And that these four things appearing in a random, or not random, these four things appearing in a in an order down the molecule must be a code. So one, two, three, four is a code. And 
we knew enough about coding theory to know that that would work, that four things, for that matter, two things, were sufficient to encode all the information in the world. Um, and that's how computers work. The two things are zero and one. Um, but so four is an excess, actually, over what you need theoretically to, uh, to encode any information you wish. So that seemed like probably how it worked. It was a code. But how did a code impress itself on a cell making, or a, on an organism, making something happen, making, as Mendel discovered, a pea turn from one color to another, or a uh, fish turn from one color to another. So there had to be a bunch of intermediate steps. And the first step was the one that was most interesting. And that was very hard to imagine. Because you have this double helix. It's actually a pretty tight little molecule. It's very long and thin, but, but it's, you can't read it very easily. If you could take apart the two strands that are, that are wound around each other, then you could read it. Because then those four different constituents look different. But they don't look different from the outside. They only look different from the inside. And Max Delbruck, who was a professor at Caltech, understood this problem better than anybody. And he said the molecule has to come apart in order to be meaningful. But how do you take something that's wound around itself apart? If you start pulling at either end, it'll just turn into knots. Because there's so many what are, are called topological constraints, just the constraint of the physical structure, that happens. So you can't take it apart by pulling on the two ends. You could take it apart by winding one around the other. I wish I had some, something other than my finger to use, but that's what I have. Um, winding one around the other. But then you'll have these two long strings, and how are they ever going to find themselves back into the structure of the double helix? The answer to the problem turns out to be, and we only discovered it many years later, that you constantly make breaks in the helix. And so you're only unwinding very small pieces at any one time. And that's the secret behind taking apart the helix. But Max said, I don't believe it. I don't believe you can take apart the two, two strands. And therefore, I don't really understand how it can be an informational molecule. And two other guys at Caltech, Messelson and Stahl, did an experiment that showed that the two strands come apart. It didn't show how, but it showed that they do come apart. And I, I won't describe that experiment, although it, is, it, has been it has been said to be the most beautiful experiment ever done. Uh, because it, uh, it used methodology that was stunning in the um, precision with which it answered the question. Yeah? What was this uh, uh, called? It's called the Messelson-Stahl experiment. Um, <laughs> Universally, that's how everybody knows it, the Messels and Stahl experiment. There's a big fat book written just about that one experiment. Um, and these were two guys, one, one a postdoc, one a graduate student at, at Caltech, who figured out how to do this, and answered the question from Max Delbruck. And when Max saw that answer, he said, obviously it does come apart. And if it comes apart, then a code makes sense. So there was a conceptual problem that needed solution before we could go forward. The next conceptual problem was 
We all, you've all heard that DNA makes RNA makes protein. But at that time, we didn't know anything about RNA. And we didn't know it was an intermediate. So we knew there was DNA and we knew there was protein. Protein is made of 20 things. DNA is made of four things. So that also defined the coding problem and actually said that you have to read the code three at a time or more, three or more at a time. Because the only way to get 20 objects made with a code of four objects is to look at triplets. If it's just doublets, you don't get enough. You, it's, it's 16. Uh, so you need more than that. And So somehow, there was a code being copied, and that code was in, involved triplets, at least. But what, was the, what were the molecular constituents? So there was reason to suspect RNA, but, and, and I, I won't go into why, and again, Experiment done at Caltech uh, in the summer of 1961 um, using some of the same methodology that Messels and Stahl had used showed that there was a new kind of RNA in virus-infected cells and that that new kind of RNA would take the code from the nucleus, take the code from DNA to, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible, take the code from DNA to the protein synthetic machinery so it could make proteins. And that was messenger RNA. And that was discovered that summer. And that almost filled what we needed to know. So we'd now gone from knowing that DNA was the hereditary material to understanding that DNA was read as a code, the code was in RNA, and that RNA carried the information from DNA to the protein synthetic machinery. And now we can make proteins. And proteins are what actually make life go. Everything that's important about life is, has a protein at the base of it. And we were beginning to understand that at the time. And so it really looked like that completed the picture and did complete the picture of molecular biology. So now you could begin to study messenger RNA. I began to study RNA viruses, viruses that have RNA as their genetic material, with the idea that they were a form of messenger RNA but an accessible form of messenger RNA, not one that's lost in the soup of, of life. Um, and that turned out to be true, particularly the viruses that we worked with. And that's why I worked on viruses, because we could isolate those molecules in viruses, but not if I wanted to understand the immune system. There was nothing I could do to find the molecules behind the immune system, the particular molecules. And then in 1975, that all changed because of the discovery of what's called, the what's called the recombinant DNA revolution. And that enabled us to work with the viruses of the immune system, the viruses of muscles, the viruses of kidneys, sorry, not the viruses, the molecules of, of, uh, of the immune system or muscles or kidney, just like we work with the molecules of viruses. And that was a uh, methodological revolution. And that was all about doing experiments. It was using various things that we had found in biological systems to give us the freedom of moving molecules from one place to another, isolating molecules and finding out what they were. And then we learned how to sequence DNA. And that was an also another major methodological revolution. 
because now we could find out what that code was. Previously, we'd worked on the code totally in isolation. But now we could work on it in the reality of making proteins. So it's been a mixture, too. And it goes on. For instance, we've discovered only in the last few years that not only does DNA make messenger RNA, but it makes a whole lot of other kinds of RNA. And those other RNAs don't have a code for protein in them. They work in entirely different ways. And so that's, in fact, some of what I'm doing in my own lab is to understand what are called microRNAs, little tiny RNAs that are made from the DNA and that play a very important regulatory role. So somebody asked me about one, because I guess you saw it in the papers that I've worked on. It's called 146A. And how do you work on something like that? Well, you find the gene that makes it, and the simplest thing to do with that gene is to take it out of a mouse. And now you have a mouse that doesn't have that gene. And now you ask, how's the mouse different from, a wild, from an ordinary mouse? And it turns out it's different in a whole lot of ways. So this thing turns out to be extremely important. And in the end, the mouse gets cancer and dies of cancer. So it's incredibly important, this little RNA. We do a lot of work isolating cancer cells and studying what happens on the can with the cancer cells. And that's a, a worldwide technology that's extremely important. So you can get cancers from people, you can get cancer from animals. Um, you can take them into the laboratory, you can grow those cancer cells and try to learn everything that's important about them. First thing that's important is what genes are f allowing that cell to be a cancer cell. So you correctly describe vaccination as putting a piece of of a virus or a bacterium into our bodies and then the immune system sees it and reacts to it and now you're immune to that organism, you're immune to that virus because you built up antibodies that see this thing as foreign and that glom onto it and get rid of it. <coughs> and, excuse me, that, I, I saw some water here. And that has worked extremely well. It's worked very well for many viruses. Um, and you've all been immunized against it, I hope, um, against all of those viruses. Mumps, measles, chicken pox, smallpox. You don't get immunized with that anymore because we've eliminated it from the planet. Um, polio. Um, and on and on it goes. Lots of childhood immunization now. And those are the successes. And they're terrific. But there are failures. HIV is a failure. We have been unable to make a vaccine against HIV. And you can ask why, and I can answer that question at whatever length you'd like. <laughs> um, but just take it from me, we've been unable to make a, a vaccine. Malaria, tuberculosis, and actually malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV are the three most serious infectious agents in the world. Not in the United States, but in the world. They kill each of them about two and a half million children in, or people, uh, mostly in Africa, every year although we're getting HIV under control to some extent. And we've never made a vaccine against Ebola, but that may be because, because we haven't tried hard enough. For the other ones, we've tried hard enough. But we, some people have found studying HIV-infected patients mostly that their immune systems are making terrific antibodies. But the antibodies are not able to protect them. 
And the reason is because, I remember I told you the immune system evolves. Well, it evolves fine if you put in a, the immune system works fine against something which is stable, genetically stable. So polio doesn't change very much from one week to another, one year to another. And so you can make an antibody against polio and you'll always be protected against polio. But HIV changes very rapidly. And so you have the immune system evolving to kill HIV. And you have HIV evolving to get away from the immune system. And HIV wins every time. And that's why you can't get an immune response against HIV to be protective. It's because of this fight between the virus and the, the immune system. And that fight can go on for a very long time inside the body. And people have spend 10 years or more infected with HIV. Um, and that fight is going on all the time in there. So the antibodies get better and better and better. The virus gets better and better and better one step ahead of the antibody. But let's say we could get those antibodies out of a person like that, and we can, and we could put those antibodies into somebody else. Now these terrific antibodies that have evolved in the presence of HIV will be there before that individual gets infected. Now when HIV tries to get into that individual, it's going to find a wall of antibodies that are terrific. And the only thing they can't do is help the person who have made the antibody. Because in that person, this process of evolution went on. But it can help everybody else, particularly as a protective agent. So, this, this has happened over the last few years. And one of the questions I asked myself was, can we use those antibodies to protect people? Now, the problem is it takes a lot of antibody to protect somebody. And antibodies are proteins. And they have a finite lifetime in the body, which is measured in weeks. And so if you wanted to use them as to protect somebody against HIV, they would have to be injected with these antibodies every few months at a minimum. And you have to be able to make huge amounts of the antibodies to do that. And if you're going to protect a lot of people, astronomic amounts of antibody. So we said to ourselves, how about if we can program the body to make those antibodies? So what does program mean? Well, in the context in which we're talking, it means putting some kind of DNA into cells and having that DNA encode antibodies, which are proteins, um, and do it over a long period of time. So we looked around and found a terrific virus into which we could insert the gene for an antibody. Actually, it's two different chains of protein. And we can put that in a mouse, that, that virus, and it will cause the mouse to make the antibody. Uh, we put it in muscle, because muscle, it turns out, is a terrific place to make protein. And the virus just sits there and, and encodes protein, makes messenger RNA. RNA makes protein. Protein is, is secreted by the muscle cells into the blood, and the blood fills up with this antibody. And it works. And we can completely protect a mouse against HIV. We can actually protect against flu and some other things, even, even malaria, using this technology. And so we're going into human clinical trials right now to see if we can actually do this in human beings and whether it's safe and effective in human beings. So I think that's what you were referring to, um, is this
alternative use of antibodies. So we're getting around the immune system. Immune system is not actually involved in this. It's entirely being done in muscle. And it's not controlled the way the human immune system is controlled. Because the human immune system works by inducing antibody, but then contracting and storing what are called memory cells. And it's actually the memory cells that protect you against the next encounter with a virus, to give you immunity. Um, and we're not going to, we don't have that system going here. Immunotherapy and cancer. So cancer cells are very similar to normal cells. And if you made an antibody against cancer cells, with a very high probability, that antibody would be an antibody against normal cells also. And so the simple notion that the immune system might protect us against cancer just doesn't work very well because cancer cells are so similar to normal cells. But there are some cancers that if you killed the normal cell that gave rise to that cancer, it wouldn't be so bad. Wouldn't be anywhere near as bad as the cancer. Um, an example of that is a cancer called melanoma. Melanoma is a, a vicious cancer um, which spreads through the body and, and, and kills people pretty quickly after it's identified. Um, and it, it, the body gives rise to melanoma because a normal cell called a melanocyte becomes a tumor cell. Melanocytes are the cells that make our skin dark, that make, give our eyes color. They're, they make pigment, dark pigment. And it, if we could get rid of melanoma by killing all melanoma cells and as a side product, product killed all the normal melanocytes, it wouldn't be nice, but it wouldn't be life-threatening. It is actually a, a situation called vitiligo in which an individual loses all of his or her melanocytes. And that happens normally to a very small number of people. But they live fine. They just get, they have to avoid the sun um, and some other things. But, but they, they can live fine. So melanoma was everybody's favorite object for using, for developing immunotherapy, including ours. And for that, what you do then is to try to stimulate the immune system to make a response to a protein on normal melanocytes. And there are a bunch of such proteins. And in fact, um, and you can make antibodies to them where you, there are two, the immune system has two arms. One arm makes antibodies, the other makes cells that, that provide immunity, they're called T cells. And so you can program T cells to respond to melanoma or you can program antibodies to respond to melanoma. T cells are better. T cells kill other cells. And that's the issue in cancer. So we started trying to make genes for T cell receptors. These are the specificity molecule on a T cell that makes it know which cells to kill and which cells not to kill. Uh, and that worked fine. And, and we could actually get an army of these cells to, to be available to kill tumor cells. But we never, it never worked well enough. So I'm not, I'm not, I won't go into that. But people at the same time were finding, and again, this is all stuff of the last couple of years, people were finding that you could get cells that would kill melanoma cells. And they wouldn't necessarily even kill normal cells. And it, 
was very mysterious, what they were seeing on the cells. So now I've got to go back a step or two to the general problem of why is a cancer cell different than a normal cell. And the answer to that, which we've found in the, again in the last few years, is very much, not entirely, but very much, that cancer cells have mutated genes in them. And that those genes are what was making the cell a tumor cell. So just think, when we're very small embryos, we have very small numbers of cells. And then we grow, the embryo grows and grows and grows. We saw a pregnant man here the other <laughs> minute um, who uh, is pretending to have a, an embryo that's growing and growing and growing. So growth is a normal process of biology. And when you get to be a full-size person, then growth slows down. And largely stops, not entirely stops. And that's great. And you reach the, but in tumor cells, clearly growth continues. But the process by which the tumor cell grows is very close to a normal process. Because after all, that cell was in a different circumstance, in the circumstance of an embryo, growing. So it has all the machinery for growth. And that's what it uses to grow and to become a tumor. So why don't we just turn to tumors? Well, because there are lots of breaks on the system. And lots of breaks come into play that hold this growth program in check and make sure that tumor cells, sorry, that normal cells don't grow. And what tumor cells have to do is break out of this control system. And they do that by changing the nature of genes. And now they don't, the, the genes are immune to the control mechanisms. Immune may be the wrong word in the context we've been talking. But they're, they're no longer sensitive to the control mechanisms. And so now the cell starts growing and growing and growing. So mutation is a very important part of cancer. So let's go back to the question now. What is the T cell system seeing in these cells to kill them? The answer is mutated proteins. So cancer cells develop large numbers of mutations. Many of those mutations have nothing to do with cell growth. They're just passengers. But they're targets. And so the immune system, which is always looking for alterations that are different than normal, sees these and reacts to them. And if you can get the immune system revved up to react hard and long to these mutated proteins, then it can kill tumor cells and rid the body of a tumor. That's immunotherapy. That's what we're doing today, is we're trying to get the immune system to recognize these mutated proteins and kill the tumor cells as a consequence of that recognition. It's not easy, and it's absolutely at the forefront of medicine. Um, there's no licensed, no, there is now one licensed drug or, or system that works on that basis, but there'll be lots of others. Um, yes, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We have to learn everything that was done before us until we get to the forefront. So when I was young, in high school, junior in high school, I had the tremendous opportunity to go to a laboratory, thanks to my mother, who found this laboratory, and said, why don't you go there for the summer? And I made one discovery in that summer that completely changed my life. And the discovery was that the forefront of science was available to me as a high school student. And I didn't have to know what all the giants had done. That somebody else could help frame a question for me 
in this case, some senior scientists who worked in this laboratory, and that I could go out and investigate it. And I could reach the point where I knew something. It wasn't a terribly important thing, but I knew something that no one else in the world knew. Because I had worked on this question and studied, in this case, mice, and gotten to the point where I knew a little something that no one else knew. And that was so empowering to have that, to know that that ability was there in me and to know that it could actually be used and would work. And so I then and there decided to devote the rest of my life to doing that. And I have. But I needed to get educated because I didn't know what the giants had done before. We'll be back to you. And so I needed to go to college. I needed to go to graduate school. I needed to be a postdoctoral fellow. And only then did I have enough of the knowledge of history, that knowledge developed over history, to go out on my own and do what is the hardest thing for a scientist to do, which is to ask my own questions. Because up to that point, I was studying questions that other people had posed. My teachers, my coworkers, books, wherever else. And then you have to know what it is that's the state of the art and be able to ask a question that the state of the art doesn't answer. And that you then have to go out and develop, ex find experimental methods to ask that question. Or in the case of theoreticians, to ask the question in the abstract. For instance, that's how mathematicians work. They don't have, they don't do experiments, they think. Uh, I'm not, I, I can't think that deeply, so I do experiments. And uh, that's been very satisfying. So I've been doing that for now 50 odd years. Um, but it, it really all started with the discovery that I could do it. Now, I don't know how special I am and how special I'm not. Clearly, not everybody can do that. Um, otherwise, we'd all be scientists. Um, and certainly, not everybody wants to do that uh, because there are other things that are exciting arts, finance, you name it. Uh, but you've got to find out whether you've got it in you and whether it gives you such a satisfaction that that's what you want to do in your life. And that involves getting into the right circumstances. Getting into college, going to college. For what we do, going to graduate school. Um, and then you can, by that time, have a, an armamentarium with which to approach the frontiers of science yourself. So if you live in the United States, you live anywhere between six and nine hours separated from Sweden. And Sweden is where the Nobel Prizes are given. So wise heads get together of a morning in Sweden and after actually a very long process culminates, they decide that this year they're going to give the Nobel Prize to no more than three people in a given field. Take physiology or medicine, which is the field in which I want it. And having made that decision, they now call that indivi the, the individuals involved and tell them. But because of the time differential, we're all asleep. So almost all Nobel laureates have that story to tell about being awakened by a phone call in the middle of the night. 
Now, it's done on a defined day. For the physiology or medicine, it's the first Monday in October. But in 1975, when I was called, I didn't know that because it never occurred to me that I was going to win a Nobel Prize. People had said, and I, I can describe the experiments that led to the prize, people said to me, you're going to win a Nobel Prize. And I said, that was wonderful. Um, and since all Nobel laureates I'd ever seen were lucky to be able to walk, never mind uh, being 37 years old, which is what I was, um, they were very old. Uh, I figured, you know, if I win a Nobel Prize, I'll be their age when I win the Nobel Prize, uh, which would be minimum 60. So I was sort of halfway there. And so I was asleep in bed on the first Monday. I was actually in New York. I was then an MIT professor in, in Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, but I was on sabbatical. I had just come to New York on sabbatical. And I got a phone call at 6.30 or 6 in the morning. And it was my wife. Now, where was my wife? She was in Denmark at a scientific meeting. And she had just given her talk at the meeting. And there was a chairman of the session in which she was talking. She's a scientist also, microbiologist. And he was from Sweden. And he knew that the Swedes had met that morning and had decided to give the Nobel Prize to three of us, Renata Del Becco, Howard Temin, and I, and me. And so he but he also knew that the prize was not going to be announced until what would be 7 o'clock in the morning in New York. Um, and so he tried to summarize that session, talking as long as he possibly could. But he got to the end of it and he said, I don't have anything more to say. He's actually a genius at doing that kind of thing. I don't have anything more to say. And there's something I want to tell you all. And um, it's going to jump the gun, but I'll tell you. And he announced that this was actually a virology meeting. It was very appropriate that um, the three of us would get the Nobel Prize. So Alice, my wife, bolted for the phone and called me. So I am the only Nobel laureate ever to be told that they won the prize by their wife. <laughs> And I, I, so I hung up the phone after a conversation, which she told me, don't let it, don't let it go to your head. <laughs> and it was silence. Nothing was happening. No bells were going off. No phones were ringing. Uh, and actually, we had a small child, a one-year-old child at the time. And uh, she was up with a nanny who was taking care of her. And so I went out to the main room of the apartment we were living in. I said, did you hear the phone ring? She said, yes, there was a phone ring. So I, I knew it was a real call. <laughs> I hadn't dreamt the whole thing. And it was just about that moment when the phone started ringing. And then it never stopped for the rest of the day. Um, so that's my story. Now, why, what did I do to make, to make Sweden call me at the tender age of 37? I didn't think it was so tender then. I mean, for you, 37 is ancient, right? <laughs> uh, that's, um, and what I did was to discover a protein called the reverse transcriptase. And it is a, a protein that copies RNA into DNA. Now, 
you all know that the central dogma of biology is that DNA makes RNA makes protein. So what good is an enzyme that copies RNA into DNA, goes backwards? Well, it sort of makes genes because DNA are genes. RNA isn't, except for viruses. And so here's a reversal of the flow of information. So that alone was enough to generate interest in Sweden. But we discovered it as the way that tumor-inducing viruses duplicate themselves. So this was a protein found in tumor-inducing viruses. That's where we found it. And what it does is to uh, take the genetic material of these viruses, these are RNA-containing viruses, and copy it into DNA. Then it goes inside a cell, goes into the nucleus, makes itself part of the chromosome, and now it has turned a viral genome into a set of cellular genes. And every time that cell divides, it passes on to its progeny these viral genes. And if the viral genes include genes that cause cancer, then it's passing on cancer from one generation to the next. And that was one of the very first clues to the fact that cancer was due to genes. Because up to then, we didn't really know what caused cancer. Um, so that's why the, uh, the combination of violating the central dogma and explaining the genetic basis of cancer led the uh, Swedes to wait only five years between the time we made the discovery and the time I got the prize and led me to be asleep at that time. Now, unfortunately, other people who think they're going to win a Nobel Prize and are aware of that day don't sleep <laughs> that night while I wait for that phone call. And because um, in California, it comes like 4 a.m. And I think that's sad. It's sad because most of them aren't going to win the prize. There are very few, no I mean, they're just in biology, three a year. That's very few. And there are lots of deserving people who never win a Nobel Prize. Uh, so just because you're deserving isn't enough to be certain that the Swedes will understand that because of the competition, because there's just so many people and so many things happening all the time. 